Dear Public Health Insight listeners, my name is Will, and we hope that everyone is doing well today. Before we begin this week's episode, we wanted to share that Public Health Insight has recently partnered up with the Canadian Global Health Students and Young Professionals Summit. This is an annual volunteer-led event aimed at engaging, connecting, and inspiring young professionals and students interested in the field of global health. Given the challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic, the planning committee has decided that this year's event will be held on a virtual platform and also will be available free of charge for all interested participants. Registration is now available and more information can be found at the link in the description. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the episode. Public health is a population-based field of science focused on preventing disease and promoting health. Every week, we will be engaging in interactive discussions and analyses of the latest public health issues affecting you and your communities all around the world. This is the Public Health Insight Podcast. My name is Gordon, your host for this podcast episode, and I'm here with LaShawn, Linda, and two, yep, that's right, two special guests who will be introduced later. Before we move on, it is important to note that the views expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent any of the organizations we work for or are affiliated with. There are more than 50 million people living with dementia worldwide, and the number continues to grow every year. In this episode, we'll be dissecting a white paper titled Redefining the Standard of Dementia Care by Memories, and also looking at an article titled, As Humanity Ages, the Number of People with Dementia Will Surge, by The Economist. We'll be discussing some of the unintended consequences of a global increase in life expectancy and an aging population, the global impact of dementia, gaps in dementia funding and research, misconception and stigma, and the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 for those living with dementia. To discuss these incredibly important issues, we are pleased to be joined by two very knowledgeable guests. Praja Vaikundarajan completed her Master's of Science in Global Health at McMaster University and during that experience gained a newfound interest in health technology. Captivated with the ever-growing field and its ability to ameliorate the lives of many, she was motivated to pursue an internship with Memories, a healthcare startup company focusing on dementia care, where she gained first-hand experience in marketing, business development, and project management. Continuing her work with Memories part-time, Praja seeks to unify her endeavors in medicine and healthcare technology in her career moving forward. Rishan Dindyal is currently a medical student also pursuing a Master of Business Administration at Tulane University in New Orleans. Through his own experiences as a caregiver to his grandfather, he was inspired to start Memories. Having previously worked at, at Uber and Maple Online Health, he is passionate about leveraging his background in technology and healthcare to make a lasting impact in the dementia landscape. Welcome to the Public Health Insight Podcast, Praja and Rishan. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Excited to be here. Awesome. So we'll start by talking about um, the global population and the increase in life expectancy. So in Canada, um, the number of seniors uh, who are 65 years and older um, is constantly growing. And currently, they make up about 17% of the population. And we expect this number to increase to 20% by the year 2024. Um, the situation in the U.S. is is very similar as well, uh, with seniors making up, as at present, 56 million people in the population. And not too long ago, uh, the life expectancy at birth that we were seeing, um, you know, about 100 years ago was only about uh, 30 years old. In the 1960s, it rose to 52 years old. And currently, we're fortunate to see the life expectancy is somewhere in the region of you know 70 for men and 75 years old for women. So you know why are we seeing um, this increase in trend in for life expectancy for Canada and the U.S. and also in other global regions? What are some of those factors that are important to talk about when we're looking at the increase in life expectancy? I guess definitely the biggest one that comes to mind is that we have more you know, remedies, more cures, more therapies for illnesses that in the past would have taken people's lives sooner. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, uh, life expectancy has increased. Yeah. And when you think of things like um, vaccines and antibiotics, right, a lot of people would die mm-hmm. um, at an early age from, you know, more right. the infectious disease. Um, now we're seeing a shift because we have all these treatments and medical advancements to 
to um, handle people who have an infectious disease. Now the burden of disease is more shifting to, you know, the chronic diseases, which is what we're talking about with dementia. And industrialization played a huge role in Mm -hmm. life expectancy and lowering uh, child mortality. I believe in the 1800s, they reduced the number of children working in these factories because factories were able to increase production through technology. And so Mm -hmm. that played a huge role in just our overall increase in aging population. Perfect. And as a, you know, as a global population begins to age, uh, you know, that means people live longer. And as I, as we discussed, the proportion of the population that are considered older adults um, will also increase. And so will the number of people who are living with dementia. So let's take a deeper dive and explore um, what what is dementia? What do we mean when we say dementia? Sure. I mean, I can take a stab at that. So just speaking generally, dementia is an umbrella term for a set of symptoms, typically including uh, cognitive function. Usually it's a constellation of symptoms that do form a diagnosis, but dementia is not, and Alzheimer's is not definitively diagnosed post until postmortem. Mm. Um So a lot of symptoms that come into play, whether that's memory loss, cognitive impairment, confusion, apathy, um, and inability to concentrate as much as in the past, all of these things are are part of, I would say, the diagnostic criteria for a physician or a healthcare team member that's looking at an individual, but there's many other factors that come into play. There's different kinds of dementia and Alzheimer's. So it's very much, um, you start with an umbrella term of dementia and as you learn more about an individual as they progress and you do more tests and try different treatments um, you start to understand what kind of disease they're actually dealing with whether it's vascular in nature or perhaps Lewy body dementia traditional alzheimer's or something else and then um, move more into supportive care after that so does that mean i'm wondering then i guess for a clinician or healthcare provider is it important when you're you know figuring out like the prognosis and the treatment and how to best to care for these individuals is it important to tease out which specific type of dementia the person um, is diagnosed with i mean in theory yes mm. um, different treatment protocols for different sorts of ailments but similarly uh, similar symptoms present in all cases mm. um, and i think as the disease progresses you sort of understand a bit more usually what you'll see with some individuals um is they will start with a normal constellation of symptoms and at some point things will sort of take a turn into more heavily symptom or more mm-hmm. heavy symptom presentation. And at that point, it's usually quite clear what's going on with the individual, but understanding that in the beginning is a little tough. Mm-hmm. So I think most of um, care guidelines and things, what you'd like to do is tr- sort of intervene or assess an individual as early as possible, see them as they start to begin on any sort of cognitive decline journey mm-hmm. um, and then work with them from them from then. So you have the largest set of data to sort of go off of in terms of their care plan. Awesome. So we know that someone is diagnosed with dementia about every three seconds. And some research has indicated that, you know, particularly in the UK, um, one in every two people knows someone directly who is living with uh, dementia. And the number of people um, living with dementia is expected to reach as high as, you know, 75 million in 2030. And, you know, astronomically, 130 million people in the year 2050. So given the situation with dementia and many other comorbidities that might be occurring, can aging be considered a threat to quality of life? And since aging in of itself is not necessarily um, preventable uh, due to the natural course of biology, why wouldn't we then consider, you know, dementia as a natural part of aging? So I can speak to that. So I think that aging is like the only reason and the only risk factor for dementia is a huge misconception. It is true that age does mm-hmm. contribute to dementia, but um, it's not only that. So for example, there is such a thing as early onset. So that's about like 10% of cases. And also a lot of people um, increase their chances of obtaining dementia due to just lack of exercise smoking, alcohol, um, blood pressure. So there's a, there's a huge range of factors that contribute to dementia. And so just focusing on the fact that aging causes it can lead us to kind of eliminate a lot of different opportunities for like prevention as well as uh, treatment and care. That's a great point, Praja. And I know you listed a few, but maybe if you could speak a little bit more to the prevention aspect, because um, I kind of got the impression that 
dementia, it, because it's so prevalent that it's almost inevitable, like it will more than likely just happen. But you're saying that there are some steps that can be taken um, to prevent. I think to clarify, these steps can be taken to prevent the age of onset. So because age is still a contributing factor, okay. um, um, you can get it, for example, when you're 90, but in order to prevent it, you from getting it even when you're 65, 70, 80, there's a lot of just like healthy habits that can be maintained to limit the onset or the age of onset. And I, I think that's an interesting point. And it kind of reminds me back to the traffic episode and kind of the way traditionally that was approached by saying um, these are road traffic accidents kind of indicating that you can't really do anything to prevent it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think kind of the terminology um, when we're looking at this also kind of indicates, hey, this Alzheimer's or dementia is preventable and there are modifiable risk factors that we can take into account to either delay the onset or you know, improve the quality of life. And we'll we'll touch more on that. Mm -hmm. And a big part of dementia is just ensuring that the care given and the actual condition is managed because it's, it, it is a progressive disease. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what a lot of um, money is going towards just in terms of management because currently we don't have like a nice, beautiful cure. Yeah, I, I think a point to make here is as everyone ages, your cells begin to senesce. Telomere shorten age-related degeneration is something that happens and it increases the risk for numerous different diseases. Um, and there are certain risk factors that can be reduced like smoking, alcohol, drinking, and other things, as well as sleep. Increasing sleep has been um, very well documented to sort of uh, improve brain function. Essentially, you sleep and you filter out everything through your glymphatic system in the brain that's built up through wear and tear in the day in terms of toxins and metabolites. And I think doing things that will improve overall brain health as well as exercise can reduce the risk of developing dementia, not necessarily as preventable as sort of um, other me measures are for, let's say, cardiovascular disease, as there is an age-related risk factor, there is a genetic component as well. Uh, but I think it's moving towards sort of better cognitive health at the earliest age possible it is a treatment plan that everybody can sort of um, take part in. I really love that because I think often we have this idea that, you know, aging is, I guess, Gordon, as you had mentioned, like a threat to quality of life. But instead, Rashawn, what I'm hearing you say is there are steps we can take to promote healthy aging because we will all age. But how do we do it in a way that reduces the risk to our health? Absolutely. Dementia is, as we discuss, is a global health problem. And, you know, no matter the income of the country that we're talking about, um, we find that dementia disproportionately affects um, people who are considered seniors um, in the age group 65 and older. But in particular, uh, low and middle income countries are disproportionately affected, as we found. 58% um, as of 2015 of the people that were diagnosed with dementia globally were actually living in those low and middle income countries. And mm. this discrepancy um, is projected to grow even wider, uh, reaching as high as, you know, 68% of people with dementia living in those low and middle income countries. So from our discussion with aging and how um, the life expectancy is different in, you know, high and low middle income countries, I'm wondering then, um, wouldn't we then expect the opposite trend. So when we expect that um, the countries that are having um, a higher life expectancy would be disproportionately affected by dementia and not the other way around? I mean, I can take a first stab at this. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I'll, I'll raise a point which uh, probably may be um, somewhat different than I would say a traditional approach to this, but you're right. Uh, I mean, in terms of the the length of life um, for individuals living in developing countries, for example, it may not be as long mm -hmm. um, as somebody in a developed country, for sure. And I think they're also um, dealing with different things, whether those are more infectious diseases in nature rather than chronic diseases mm -hmm. and a whole host of other factors. But something that uh, can easily be missed is the cumulative effects of stress mm -hmm. um, and what that takes on your body, um, the suppression of your immune system and how that affects cells all over and what that represents in terms of long-term health outcomes. You can see in um, like public health studies in the past, chronic stress can lead to generations of individuals that are actually shorter than the previous generation, mm -hmm. um, as well as accelerated risk for other diseases. And that's documented. And I think um, understanding the interplay of stress and extreme levels of, let's say, cortisol in the body um, is still something that can be explored. 
Um, and it's somewhat underlooked when it comes to just looking at numbers and let's say um, risk factors in terms of diseases. Uh, but living in a stressful situation, not having an, an appreciation or, or way to essentially cope with um, things that you're dealing with that isn't cumulatively building and right. affecting your mental workload in that sense um, definitely can exacerbate a situation um, that is cognitive in nature. That's what I would say. Awesome. I think that actually goes back to something um, yourself and Praja mentioned earlier that um, aging is not the only risk factor for dementia. Um, like you said, there's other environmental factors uh, that serve as risk factors for the onset of dementia. And another thing I was thinking about too, as you you know you explained it, um, people um, and Project made the point too about early onset dementia. Maybe I don't know what the numbers are, but maybe it's a case where th- there's a higher percentage of early onset dementia in those low and middle income countries. So that would be less related to aging. So that could be a potential hypothesis as well. Another hypothesis I kind of have, uh, you know, take it with a grain of salt, is um, because the life expectancy, you know, at the baseline is lower, um, you know, if we look at today as a reference point, the life expectancy in low and middle income countries is lower. So basically they have a, a more of a room to grow to get to where the life expectancy currently is for high income countries. So I guess that, um, the percentage growth in life expectancy um, could partially also explain why the projections in 2030 and 2050 have low middle income countries basically um, furthering the divide with the dementia cases. There's also the fact that these low and middle income countries used to have such a high younger population, but because of once again our technologies and mm. vaccines and et cetera, they are mm-hmm. all living longer, but there's also more of them. And so that those specific countries don't, do not have the infrastructure to handle and deal with all these problems. Mm-hmm. They don't have the healthcare services that we do. So that is plays a huge role in not just like the stress that they have to endure, but also the quality of life that they have, the healthcare. They do not prioritize things like exercise as well as like nutrition as much as we do here so a huge part of why Mm -hmm. they may be getting more dementia later on is because just the rest of their quality of life is not uh up to par Um, as ours right so like they don't have the resources to allocate in the same way that a higher income country would have to address those underlying risk factors Mm -hmm. and they also like for example countries like france back in the day they had so much time to Um, kind of manage the increase in population, whereas countries in sub-Saharan Africa don't have as much time um, to kind of get the resources together to handle the same uh, increase in population. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit to talk about, um, while we're talking about the, you know, the resources available to allocate towards dementia and how, you know, uh, this is different depending on the countries. That we're we're talking about, um, we know that dementia dementia research uh, receives less funding um, than you know initiatives focusing on cancer or other heart heart diseases. Uh, for example, in the in the UK, dementia as a percentage of the funding that goes towards um, cancer was only at seven point four percent, and as a percentage of the funding that goes towards uh, coronary heart disease, it is twelve uh, percent. So we can see that there is also disparities in the way um, we, we prioritize research and funding to focus on these chronic diseases. Yeah, I, I think for me, what was especially striking was looking at some of the, the research that goes into dementia, um, even in the global setting, you find that only 10% of the research that has been done is conducted in low and middle income countries. And this is striking because as we already mentioned, the, the significant burden of dementia is going to be coming from or is currently coming from low and middle income countries. And so if there's not, I guess, context specific research and research being conducted um, in a way that benefits the population that it's intended to benefit, such as individu- individuals from low and middle income countries, we, we might miss individuals and it may not be you know, we, we, at the end of the day, the research we provide 
we want it to go directly to benefit our communities. And、mm-hmm. if only 10% of the research on dementia is done in low and middle income countries, I think we're missing something there from a global perspective. I think to use a term I hate to use, but to piggyback of your comment there,、um, <laughs> I, 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 I said a say, lot. Okay.、Um, It's, this is actually something that's very、uh, important to memories right now in terms of the, the outreach that we're trying to do through our social media. And a lot of that comes from stigma. When it's、mm. uh, a minority country, perhaps it's a community that、um, does have a lot of family values ingrained in it. I can personally, for example, speak to, let's say, the South Asian community. A lot of、um, age related degeneration, let's say that's dementia or cognitive impairment or other things, are typically spoken of as such. That、mm. uh, the individual is getting older. This just makes sense. This is an area of perhaps、mm. stigma and shame、um, mm-hmm. within that community. And these thoughts are exacerbated、um, and they cycle through communities generation after generation. So when you have that sort of understanding built into the systems that people are being trained on moving forward, there isn't going to be a reach forward to、um, move forward in research in this space to, per- to generate researchers that are interested in providing a cure for this、um, or getting involved. So I think,、um, yes, there is somewhat of a selection bias in. Terms of the, the groups, and it、mm. may be a, a very homogenous in terms of the people that are being tested, as well as the researchers and other things. But、mm. I think there is also one more layer as to why these cycles have perpetuated.、Uh, that's something that needs to、uh, the multifaceted approach to dementia care、um, and understanding dementia in terms of its global prevalence also needs to stem from what cultural understandings of this disease are like. Yeah, thanks for bringing up that point, Rashawn, because、um, you know, his, historically, Dementia was even called, you know, senile dementia or senility. And generally speaking, as we've discussed in this episode,、um, there's kind of a mis- misconception that dementia is an inevitable、mm-hmm. part of the aging process. And this belief is held by, you know, two thirds of the general public. And even we think the general public,、um, because there's different levels of education and different you know, people are in different fields of study and stuff like that. But this was, this was also a prevalent belief. Even in the medical community,、um, as you know, as identified in the Alzheimer's disease、uh, international survey that was conducted. So,、um, I think based on what you're saying, too, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of you know, education and awareness about、um, dementia, Alzheimer's, and then and the stigma associated with it to kind of、um, let people know that you know, dementia is a, basically a biological disease. and You know, in certain cultures, like you mentioned, they, you know, certain, you know, in many African countries,、um, witchcraft is, you know,、uh, a very、um, cultural concept. And a lot of people believe that, you know, dementia related symptoms、um, is related to witchcraft. So we have a lot of work to do when it comes to misconception、mm-hmm. and stigma. Absolutely. I think one thing that I wanted to add here, too, like in terms of the quantity and volume of research being done. For dementia and Alzheimer's compared to the other diseases you mentioned. I think there's two things to really note here. One, yes, dementia and Alzheimer's、um, very biological in nature.、Um, and if you look at sort of what's happening、um, at the cellular level,、um, drugs that have shown some sort of benefit, typically cholinesterase inhibitors like rivastigmine and galantamine, those have historically been used,、um, little benefit but still present. Most of the core issues relating to beta amyloid plaque formation,、um, the neurofibrillary tangles, and other things、um, that we all know of, I think as, we, as, they, as research tries to dive into these areas and solve these problems of like plaque accumulation and other things, it has not been super successful as of late,、um, mm. actually, in general. And because of that,、uh, the people who, who are funding research, people who want to get involved in research and produce results, would like to be published and would like to have significant contributions、mm. to the scientific space. And it's a very demoralizing. Moralizing situation to be in if you、uh, appreciate that this research has not gone in the direction of success that、um, would generally be mm, wanted. That's、right. one barrier. And then institutions are the ones that fund researchers, whether that's Universities or government agencies or other things. And if、um, the researchers aren't producing results, but you can put a grant in cardiovascular disease research and、uh, perhaps get a drug breakthrough that'll support the、um, draw of people coming to your institution, raise the credibility of that institution as well, then the money's going to go there. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point, Rashawn. And I was reading some articles that were also mentioning kind of stats about how recent. Uh, PhD graduates who have focused on dementia in the past within four years of working in that field often switch out. And I think、um, some of your reasons can attest to why they choose to do this because maybe they're not, it's not favorable in the grant process or maybe、um, 
like you said, there may be not a lot of cures or solutions that are out there. So maybe they might not think um, their research would be able to get published. Right. I think it just speaks to our culture in general. We want that quick fix. We want that cure as opposed to generating new knowledge or helping um, people to maintain um, some level of independence, even if you can't find a cure to dementia, for example. That research is still valuable, but the way our academic culture mm-hmm. views it, you know, if there's no cure, if, if it's not a significant result, then it's not worth funding. So I think that's it's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. And it puts such a burden on not only the people with dementia, but their caregivers as well. Mm-hmm. Just the fact that they're kind of wandering around this um, diagnosis on their own. Exactly, yes. I also just wanted to kind of bring up the point. Oh, first of all, um, September is actually World Alzheimer's Month. So um, this is a great timely topic that we're speaking of. But the other thing I also wanted to kind of get your thoughts on is what is the role of public health in, I guess, dementia? And, you know, what are kind of some of those public health concepts that we can kind of use to uh, raise awareness or, you know, some concepts that we can use as public health professionals? Public health has, you know, mainly plays a role in, you know, the health promotion and health protection side of things. So, you know, primary prevention, which includes raising awareness, uh, reducing the stigma, as we just talked about, um, looking for evidence-based practices that we can implement on the, you know, population level. Uh, but as we, you know, we're learning, there's a lot of work to be done in, in terms of dementia care. Um, so what are some, what is the role of, you know, you can even speak from, you know, the healthcare systems perspective. Mm. Um, and we'll get into this later on in the next episode in more detail. And what is the role of healthcare, the healthcare system and maybe healthcare tech in terms of, Um, combating some of these misconceptions and to support dementia care? So I think like the role of public health and just our members of uh, healthcare is not to just focus on the cure of these chronic illnesses, but how to manage it. Because as you Mm -hmm. said, the research is very clear in the sense that there is no cure currently and they're not putting enough resources into research to find it. So we as public health professionals or global Mm -hmm. health professionals, we need to find a way to manage um, the consequences of this fact. And so um, focusing on just long-term care homes as well as assisted living homes and the fact that they may not, the quality Mm -hmm. of life that these dementia patients have there may not be as great as what caregivers would want. That's something that we should put effort in. It has been very evident with this COVID pandemic, um, just evident in the public media and on the news, how the quality of life in long-term care homes is not sufficient and making an effort to provide resources to caregivers because so many of these caregivers are working unpaid hours, taking time off work, experiencing um, professional and Mm. personal um, sacrifices, as well as this dual strain that they experience as a family member, as well as a caregiver. All of these things are not, um, are not well researched and also a lot of people don't have enough resources. So if this is an issue in higher income countries such as Canada, I can't even imagine what to say for low to middle income countries. Yeah, I think um, Praja raised a fantastic point. And I think this does bring up to light a critique um, that I have in terms of the sort of the public health approach in situations like this. Um, And I think it's typically a bit more top down. And Mm -hmm. you can see with all the terms mentioned so far, things like health promotion, protection, and other things, a lot of them are focused on yeah, knowledge sharing, um, uh, of course, having um, content that's available in plain English and being there as for resource management is key for um, populations that are in distress. But I think a term that's often missed um, and can be leveraged by the public health community is advocacy. Uh, I think these individuals really need folks um, in their community who have mm-hmm. a unique perspective of being um, understanding of the healthcare system, the resources that are there, as well as the effect that diseases um, and support can take on an individual, bringing those concerns forward, leveraging community-based resources for the people who are there and removing some of the burden from the tax long-term care homes and other systems. I think that advocacy level of public health Mm -hmm. is where things need to move in order to have more sustainable change in communities. It's a great point. Yeah. And on that point, um, because we, you know, uh, we're based in Canada and we, you know, we talk about Mm -hmm. the U S a lot. So let's focus on those two for a second. Um, so in Canada, there's an average of, um, I believe, 25,000 newly diagnosed cases of dementia every year. 
and presently there's about half a million people living with dementia. Uh, comparing that to the U.S., astonishingly, um, 10,000 people turn 65 years old every day uh, in the U.S., and there's about 6 million seniors uh, living with dementia in the United States, making up 2% of the entire population. So when we compare that to low-middle-income countries who uh, experience a lot of the burden of dementia, um, a lot of it is, uh, from my knowledge, is concentrated in more you know Western Europe and East Asia. Um, so when we look at those countries, um, when we break it down by region, particularly in the context of uh, China and India and Europe, um, what we see, particularly for China, is that there's about 10 million people living with dementia. And in India, we can see that there's about 4 million people living with dementia and so on and so forth. So why is it the case that some countries or regions, I know, um, I think Praja did touch on this a little bit before. Why are we noticing some of those regional differences in the number of people living with dementia um, across different, the different regions? I think one reason can be again, bringing back the idea of stigma and just believing that dementia is mm -hmm. a part of the aging process and so therefore not being officially diagnosed. Mm -hmm. I think that plays a big role in the actual number. So that's something that we should always keep in mind right. when discussing like the actual official prevalence within countries. Right, too. And I'm even wondering as well, um, we talk about a lot how there's a lot of challenges with the, the healthcare capacity of lower and middle income countries. And I'm wondering too, if under diagnosis or under reporting is also a problem in low and middle income countries, do we even have a full grasp of uh, the number of cases that are there? Mm -hmm, exactly. I don't know if you guys remember, but when the COVID pandemic, maybe March or April, the numbers that were reported coming from Sub-Saharan Africa were very, very low. Mm. And people who have knowledge in the field realize that obviously they definitely have COVID cases. They're just not reporting it, but that's not right, right. as evident mm -hmm. to the general public. Yeah. And I think to talk about two things here, one in relation to the like large numbers in each geographic region, culture is always needs to be part of the conversation. And I think um, generally mm -hmm. speaking, if you look at um, non-Western cultures, a lot of it does focus around um respect and care for the elders and the people that um, really are, are core to that family unit mm. living and growing mm. in one household and supporting them for the rest of their lives is very inherent to a lot of places outside of North America. Um, and because of that, there is that support. And uh, I would say outside of care related, but definitely more individuals that are living at home longer um, and part of that unit in, in non-Western cultures. Um, and the thing to say about prevalence is absolutely 100% um, there's underreporting. And I think outside of just dementia, mental health related disorders are grossly mm. misrepresented um, in countries outside of North America, mm -hmm. where stigma, once powerful. again, um, instead of be perhaps depression or, uh, or suicide or other things being listed as a cause of death, um, it's just unsure. Um, and, and those have been noted on death note certificates and other things. And that's mm -hmm. mostly because of cultural practices. So I think um, absolutely um, there's misrepresentation in terms of prevalence. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our content and would like to stay up to date, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. To learn more about our community initiatives and how you can support us, visit our website at thepublichealthinsight.com. Join the PHI community and let's make public health viral.